The Topps 2022 Series 1 Baseball NFT Collection dropped today and is available now at TopsNFTs.com. Buy standard and premium packs of officially licensed NFT digital collectibles featuring your favorite players and teams from one of Topps' most popular sets. A standard pack comes with a guarantee of one rare NFT collectible in each pack, and a premium pack comes with a guarantee of one super rare NFT collectible in each pack. Those who can get their hands on this limited release can also resell unopened packs or individual NFTs directly from their collection in the Topps NFT marketplace. This highly anticipated release includes brand new products such as Stars of MLB Chrome, Generation Now, Ultra Short Print, Team Cube 2.0, and a special 1987 35th anniversary motion set. Head to ToppsNFTs.com now as this release is slated to sell out fast. Welcome to Rates and Barrels, presented by Tops. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. On this episode, we discussed the story that Eno had published at The Athletic on Thursday, where it is revealed that swinging is bad. It is just bad for the hitters to swing at pitches. We'll talk about why that might be a problem. I know we teased this a little bit on the Monday show, but now that the story is out, we can talk a little bit more about that. We continue our Is Something Wrong With Blank series moving on to pitchers on this episode. And I I changed the question. Instead of what's wrong with, which implies that something is wrong, it's now (laughs) is something wrong with, which seems like a much more fair way to ask these sorts of questions about people in general, but especially, (laughs) um, you know, pitchers. So we've got uh, scouting. Sometimes this this industry is so hard. (laughs) We're just mean sometimes. Like not not even intentionally. We're just absolutely mean. (laughs) He's terrible. He spent 15 years in the big leagues, went to the all-star game 10 times, won four (laughs) batting titles. Oh, he's awful. What is his strikeout rate? Not not high enough, so it's not sustainable, so he sucks. He's like 85% (laughs) of a Hall of Famer, but 15% (laughs) total clown. Get rid of him. Why do we even let him play in the league? (laughs) <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think you and I both sort of entered this space at a relative peak in, uh, you know, we are smarter than the teams, I think, on behalf of like baseball writing or at least advanced baseball. I literally writing. thought, of, yeah, I literally, yeah. I was on fan grabs being like, these guys are idiots. Oh, I 10 years ago was writing player updates at Rotowire, and I thought I was smarter than the GMs in the league, which is probably, <laughs> um, you know, me overestimating myself by a lot uh, <laughs> in in hindsight. But hey, look. you know, I think it's an interesting thing, though, because like, you know, appeals to authority are not great either. Like, the, you know, not every organization is run am- amazingly and not every, you know, not every GM is that smart. And you shouldn't just be like, well, he runs a major league team. So you're uh, you're opinion is invalid you know right so it's like there's a it's an interesting tug you know i try uh to to sort of couch things and give people credit and and you know and then sometimes i write that orioles fastball piece and i'm just mean i guess (laughs) sometimes but the royals fastball piece it the whole thing it, it comes back to if you remember like if you were if you were back in high school if you were just one of the better students in your school, maybe the person listening to this was valedictorian or something. I, I was not. I was not at that level, but I was, I don't know, top 15% or something in my class and took the advanced classes. And I thought I was great. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm but a 4.0 student and going to the school that I want to go to for college. It's going to be great. I'm, I'm really smart. And then I got to college and was around a bunch of other people who had similar credentials. And I realized, oh, wait a minute. No. There are a lot of other very smart people, smarter than me people in this world. And then there's all these other people that went to better schools than the one I went to. They're probably smarter or at least as smart as I am as well. And that was a good humbling experience. And I think I've at least come around as I've discovered more and more people who've gone on to become analysts, people who've worked in the game and then come back out, got to know more people. There are smart people all over baseball, too. And yes, right. You're right. Inside like, and out. I mean, right. that's the key. Right. It's both. It's just, it, yes, you're, you're right to not appeal to authority. But if you think you're smarter than everyone else, you probably are not. That's just, I mean, I literally had that experience 100 percent. And uh, the only thing that prepared me for it a little bit, and I remember this, was uh, Justice Stephen Breyer spoke at our at our commencement. He wasn't a Supreme Court justice at the time, I don't think. 
for high school time. Commencement? Yes, I went to one of those high schools anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Our geometry but... teacher, who we really liked, was our speaker. <laughs> He's awesome. He's a great geometry teacher, but yeah. he did not go on to become a Supreme Court justice. Uh, he said there's always something, somebody out there who knows something better than you do. Yeah. And uh, I think that's that's huge. I mean, I think that the best organizations do that. They find people that are really smart. They listen to them. They put them in roles. They give them autonomy, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but it also means something for uh, how you try to put your ideas out into the world uh, with humility. So with that, let's play what's wrong with these people <laughs> yeah i mean we will try and diagnose what's happening and uh i i just dropped the swinging is bad okay uh, <laughs> on the screen which probably gives everybody a if you didn't know already how old i am or how young i pretend to be despite my age that should <laughs> clarify both of those questions that you might my kids have. are so tired of me doing tp for my bunghole oh man i mean that is 30 years ago yeah I'm an old man. They, so it's interesting. Your kids do not respond to Cornholio. They don't like do it. kind of like it. They just like me saying bunghole. And then they just say bunghole a bunch. And they don't worry about the rest of it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, I think, I think this is a, the, the, actually the most interesting piece for me. The, the, so swinging is bad. Hitters should swing less. Uh, this is probably objectively true. You can do things like look at uh, the run value on takes versus the run value on swings for, for hitters. Um, and almost everybody in the history of baseball has had a negative run value on their swings. I think it makes sense if you think about the things that can happen on a swing versus a take. I mean, a take is a ball or a strike. A swing is a strike or an out or a hit. And the hits are only 30%. So that's like the basic math there, right? We're like, oh... Oh, um, so maybe uh, that's looking at it wrong. And maybe like, we, obviously, as fans, we want swings. I think that's pretty obvious. I know that some people say they'd like to watch a batter control the, the zone and stuff. But I think that generally there's more action on swings. So we like that. Um, but one thing that one of the things that was really interesting to me was talking to Theo Epstein. And he was pointing out that the run environment, the home run environment actually determines the optimal swing rate because what happens uh, in a high home run environment, 2019, is you want to wait and you want to do what Alex Bregman said, which is I only swing at pitches I can homer on. Yeah. Because there's homers there. The so, probability of hitting a home run has gone up enough because of the conditions, largely the ball, to yeah. where you can hit more home runs than usual. So therefore and you should go better than any sort of direction. single, you know? Yeah. You should optimize with a homer, but as the home run environment comes down, the value of a single goes up because then you're not, you can't wait for that blast. You can't do two walks on a blast. You, the blast may not come. Right. So, so therefore the single. And so when I looked, I looked at the, the so I had a correlation in there that was like, you know, teams that swing less win more. That's the overall correlation since we started tracking swings. And that's how the Dodgers work. That's how the, the Giants work. That's how the A's have worked. That's how Farhan teams have worked. That's how uh, a lot of the teams, even the Padres this year, they're doing really well offensively. I hadn't looked in a while. They are best. In, they're bottom of the league in swing rate. And they are uh, like third best in, in chase rate. So, you know, this, this is generally a good approach. It's generally not a good idea to swing on pitches outside the zone. I had a number in there. You know, the slugging percentage on pitches outside the zone is 207. I mean, that's inside the zone. It's like brutal. 488. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but then I looked at the, the correlations year by year. In 2019, this, the, the, the line was super, super steep. Like the teams that swung less won. And the line was very steep. In 2014, the year before we started juicing the ball, when we had one of the lowest home run environments of the last you know, 10, 20 years, teams that swung more won more. That's when you wanted to be the Royals. And, you know, the Royals were kind of good in that era. What, what, what did they win? 13 or 15? 14 was the year they lost in seven when Bumgarner pitched the third yeah. 
uh, for the third time. So in they the either series. won before that or after that. They won Ooh. right after that. I think it was 2015. 20, 2015 was the year they beat the Mets, but 2014 they were there. I mean they they were they were an amazing performance from Madison Bumgarner in Game Seven away from winning in 2014. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't even say those Giants are like these Giants. These, those Giants were a little bit more swing and make a ton of contact, right? Joe Panic and, you know, a lot of these guys that made contact. Was that, was that the Scudero Giants or was that the year before? Anyway, um, you know, the, the, so that's a, a fascinating thing about to think about like, oh, so maybe I should have a lot of scrappy contact guys at the ready if the ball is going to be dead. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it, it changes the type of player you're looking for. And I think the the long term implications of deadening the ball, reducing the value of waiting for a pitch that you're going to try and hit out of the park. I think it's really hard to rely on that to, to say that, yeah, we're going to change the game at the top level. And then college hitters and high school hitters, mm-hmm. everyone's going to say, well, I'm not going to swing for the fences anymore. I think the main reason for that is the ball's not going to be deadened in those places. Everywhere. They're not going to use humidors at those levels. The, you're still going to be rewarded for the current approach at all of the lower levels where the ball is not reacting the way it is in the big leagues. So I, I don't think they're going to get the, at least the full desired long-term outcome with a, you know, a multi-year effort potentially to control and deaden <laughs> the ball. It takes a long time. Like even in 2019, Like, you know, like 2015, we started seeing the ball really fly out. In 2016, 2017, 2018, the ball was flying out. We were already starting to start start to set some records before 2019. Do you know how much the average launch angle changed between like 2015 and 2020? It's like one degree. That's kind of a lot, though, isn't it? It's it's no, it's rare to see movement like that. My point is. It takes a long time and it's small. <laughs> yeah. It's like these small changes. Maybe, maybe the idea of a dead ball makes, you know, Nick Madrigal and Nick, Nick, like acquiring Nick Madrigal and putting him next to Nico Horner, like a more viable strategy. You know, maybe Stephen Kwan, you know, rockets up because the team thinks, you know, maybe our, our run environment, our home run environment in Cleveland, maybe people don't hit that many home runs here. So Stephen Kwan makes a lot of sense for us. We don't need to make them hit homers. Maybe their whole strategy of having guys who make a lot of contact and control the zone and maybe uh, add power later, maybe that's related to some idea of what the home run environment is going to be. But there are teams that can maybe ideate on us and think about this and try to be out in front of it. But at the same time, would you say no to like a Joey Gallo now? I I mean, I know he's not playing very well, but would you just say no? I think it's I, I don't know if that's the answer that you want it is. Do you want to remove Joey Gallo from the game or do you just want to make sure you don't have too many players like Joey Gallo? I think the ga- the goal is I heard I forget who said this. So apologies if I'm stealing this. But the goal is to have m- as many different ways to win as possible. Yes, like when I you're mean, playing a board game, you don't want there to be just one way to win the board game. And then right. everyone's just one trying strategy to do one boring. thing and then it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about, uh, I don't know if you've ever played this game, but NES, the original Nintendo, had an ice hockey game. just called Ice Hockey. It came out in the early, late 80s. And there were three. Good market. You built your team. This is amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, they probably didn't have a deal with the NHL. But anyway. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. There were three body types for the players you could choose. There was a like a skinny, fast player uh-huh. that was really good at face-offs and like one other thing in the game. And then there was a medium player that was average across the board. And there was a big player that was a good checker that could do different things. And you always had to decide, like, well, do I want three little fast guys or do I want two big guys and a fast guy or one of each? Like that sort of three on three. Yeah, it's a three on three game. That's kind of what you want just from a a very simple standpoint of just having some choices. Well, we can mix and match. Like we've talked about this with uh, like profile diversity within the lineup. Yeah, you know, for the Yankees, you don't want too many guys that are, are three true outcome players. You want to spring or like maybe how the guys. all the Astros are high, high and tight fastball hitters. Like, you yeah, know, you need a mix. You need pitch too. You, you need you need players that present a unique set of challenges for the opposing pitcher to get out. I think that's part of the solution too. And to do that, you need players that have different 
skills. You need yeah, like, that have different approaches. I liked um, Kevin Ken Rosenthal's piece about action players. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, players that uh, swing uh, don't necessarily have a ton of patience, but uh, put the ball in play and are speedy. Um, I think uh, we can see more of those, and we're starting. Uh, we I think we do in, in Juan de Franco, Jose Ramirez, Francisco Lindor, Tim Anderson, J.P. Crawford. We have a we have a batch of, of players like that, and they're very exciting. Um, there is one player that's like gone, and I don't, but I don't know if we need it back. Which is kind of like the defense only, like in essence, like Ozzy Smith. Ozzy Smith is gone. <sighs> He was yeah. very exciting. Back in the day, Ozzy Smith was very exciting to watch, I thought. He's on the list of players where if you could just kind of bring Twitter back to the era in which a player played and just consume ridiculous highlights, he, he yeah. would have seen a lot of Ozzy Smith. We saw a lot of Ozzy Smith even in an era where it was hard to see players out of market. This, this week in baseball. <laughs> right. He would make a ton of highlight reels and VHS tapes for the, yeah. the amazing stuff he could do on the field. Yeah, you don't have players like that anymore. I mean, I think bringing the run environment down could could help Ozzy Smith, right? Because then you have a guy who's like a, a, a scrappy singles hitter who had plays amazing defense. It's just you, another way to get on base. Like the, I think the problem also is that with all these, with all these players being so much more willing to work the count and draw walks, and walks have been a big thing for more than twenty years now, understandably so. And yet the walk rate has not changed much. The walk rate doesn't change that much. It's so weird. But that the pitcher decides, I guess. I'd rather have a, a there's, two, there's two ways to get on base. You'd rather see a guy put a ball in play and get on base than stand yeah. there and wait it out and get on base. I mean, that's that's yeah, that was part of the the piece. You know, it's like, is this bad for baseball that swinging that swinging is bad? Yes, is it an Ozzy Smith type player. Let's, I mean, let's just think of like Billy Hamilton. Like the problem with Billy Hamilton as a player was that you could challenge him in the zone and there just wasn't enough he could do about it. Like the quality of pitching was just good enough to where. Billy Hamilton just couldn't hit that much in the big leagues. 240, 293, 327 line. Sure, you're yeah. annoyed if he gets on base because he is an absolute pain. He's, he's Ozzy Smith. More or less. I mean, the K rate way up because teams were just willing to challenge him. Yeah. And stuff is just better. Like, uh, was Ozzy Smith going to be a guy that struck out thing, less than too. 10% of the time in the modern game? With the the stuff that pitchers have now and the approach of pitchers right now, I'd... I mean, that's part of the question. And that's why Theo's really focused on, you know, reducing the K rate on the pitching side. And so he's really focused on pitch clocks and automated strike zone. So you can play around with the strike zone, uh, that sort of deal. So it doesn't sound like they're as focused on uh, moving the mound, which I think might be good. Yeah, moving the mound or my radical idea, letting hitters walk on ball three, because if, if, we make these changes over time and the walk rate is one of the things that hasn't changed that much in baseball history. I think you'd find the pitchers go in the zone more often. If pitchers are in the zone more often, Hey, guess what? Hitters might swing oh, a little more. If the walk rate's always been around 8% and then we shrink the zone, they 8% is the, 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 the most acceptable walks that a pitcher or team will allow from their pitcher. So pitchers will just find a way to walk 8% again, which right. means coming into the zone. You'll go in the zone more, and hitters will have more pitches to to swing at potentially, and that maybe maybe that balances out. I know maybe the fear would be that walks would go through the roof, but I don't think they would because you you know what the count is when you're pitching. You can throw balls in the zone when you want to. You just choose not to throw balls in the zone. You usually usually you can throw balls in the zone. Not ever. So I think can. that's the same thinking with shrinking the zone. Is you, they're, they're thinking about cutting the top off the zone. So. Check out the piece. There's a lot in there. I, I did think the the Soto stuff that you talked about on, on Monday's show, I thought he was a, a perfect person to talk to for the story. But I thought some of the some of the thoughts that Theo shared for this piece were very mm-hmm. interesting as well, because I thought bigger change would actually be on the table, given what we're seeing right now. And it doesn't sound like it. It really is uh, at this point. Talk about a big day in sports. The 2022 Top Series 1 Baseball NFT Collection has dropped. It's available now on TopsNFTs.com. Buy standard and premium packs of officially licensed NFT digital collectibles featuring your favorite players and teams from one of Top's most popular sets. A standard pack comes with a guarantee of one rare NFT collectible in each pack, and a premium pack comes with a guarantee of one super rare NFT collectible in each pack. Those who can get their hands on this limited release can also resell unopened packs or individual NFTs directly from their collection in the Topps NFT marketplace. 
This highly anticipated release includes brand new products such as Stars of MLB Chrome, Generation Now, Ultra Short Print, Team Cube 2.0, which is an NFT exclusive design, and a special 1987 35th anniversary motion set. Head to TopsNFTs.com now as this release is slated to sell out fast. We move on to our main focus for this episode. Mm -hmm. Is something wrong with blank? Don't you worry about blank. Let me worry <sighs> about blank. Uh, let's start with Freddie Peralta. And I, I don't think I have Freddie Peralta anywhere this season. He's fairly expensive. Fairly expensive. And in stake drafts in particular, where he was going, often at the end of round three, beginning of round four, Four, early in draft season, I was targeting closers there, and then closers got more expensive, so then I stopped doing that too. It just never worked out where I ended up with Freddie Peralta. Stuff was very good last year. Location numbers were a tick below average. Not at all surprising, given what we'd seen from Freddie Peralta in the past. And uh, I think the only concern workload-wise was that he missed some time with a shoulder injury late in the year. And you know maybe because of the six-man rotation the Brewers occasionally employ, you weren't going to get... 200 regular season innings from Freddie Peralta because they look to the playoffs and, and are managing this pitching staff with an eye toward October all season long. Uh, the ratios have been bad so far, a 509 ERA, 135 whip. Walk rate is right in line with previous career norms, uh, but we are seeing Freddie Peralta get hit more in the zone early on this season. So is there an actual problem here or is this a you know, relative small sample size bit of noise through five starts? Well, you know, I think it's kind of instructive to put him up against Brandon Woodruff because both he and Brandon Woodruff um, have about the same stuff numbers as last year. And Woodruff last year had good location numbers and still has decent location numbers this year. I just I think he's a better bet. Someone who has both plus stuff and location just is a better bet. I think what we're seeing from Freddie Peralta is a, a little bit of the U Darvish situation where it, at any given time, you can get a different kind of streak. It's like the, it's like a good hitter with a high strikeout rate. Sure. You know, it's like a, it's like this, he's a good pitcher. And I, I'm, I was looking through the different numbers on his different pitches. His slider is slightly less horizontal this year. Um, you know, I mean, I guess like four or five inches, but the model still likes him. And the reason the model liked him always from the beginning was the fact he throws with great extension. He throws the ball really close to the plate and it gets good ride. So it's very deceptive um, and really hard, harder than the 93 mile an hour uh, miles per hour on the radar gun. I think generally he still has everything he's got, but he also has the poor command that he had last year. And so I think he's going to be fine, but uh you know, uh, the walk rate will continue to be where it is. And maybe he'll change some of those walks into homers. Um, and then just generally probably give up fewer balls in play. Like right now, he's got a 340 Babbitt. So you can pair some of the old school analysis with the new school and be like, okay, the stuff is still good. The location was bad last year. The location is bad this year. Let me expect more. Like he's projected for a 280 Babbitt. Uh, you know, let me expect a 300 Babbitt going forward and a homer per nine. And so then if that, if I do that, then I'm probably going to get, you know, like a 380 ERA going forward, still right. rosterable, still a ton of strikeouts, very much to me, like a, a U Darvish where you get all the strikeouts, you get a highish ERA compared to what the stuff is you're looking at. Uh, but you get a very useful pitcher. So I think if you're hurting, especially in strikeouts, I think I would still consider him a buy low. Because he's got that volume of strikeouts. He's still going to give you like 12K9. Yeah, if if you find someone willing to move him, I think you're probably getting him and thinking, okay, maybe there was a shot going into the season. He was going to be a, an SP1 that was available kind of on the, the border of where the, the ones end and the twos begin. Looks like a firm SP2. Not a big loss if he ends up getting to those levels. Uh, the bat has him at 377 for the ERA, the rest of the way, and 121 for the whip. I think you'd be okay with that. Uh, it's not quite what you're hoping for coming up last year, but with all the K's, with it being a good team, good bullpen protecting his leads, I think you're getting plus win probability as well. That still uh, keeps his value pretty high if you're looking at Freddie Peralta. I think Brandon Woodruff, by the way, just... Lock uh, solid by... He looks fine. Like there's yeah. 
the thing that looks really good at watching his most recent start, I love his changeup right now. And it seems like he's got a lot of confidence in it. He threw three in a row at one point. Forget who was in the and That's in the his original pitch. I don't know if people know this, but like he said he had to do weighted balls to find a slider. Mm. You know, he said the weighted balls gave him a, a release point where he could actually throw a slider. But he said in college he was more of a, a changeup guy. Yeah, so. I just love the movement on it right now. It just seems like he's locating it really, really well, uh, down and away uh, to left-handed hitters especially. Uh, how about Jose Barrios? Is there anything wrong with Jose Barrios right now? K rate down under 20%, walk rate up compared to where it was last year, but not far off his career mark. Uh, it is interesting. His swinging strike rate is still down. It was down a bit last year, just under 10% a year ago. Right around 9.5% right now. Among the many pitchers we're going to talk about today with an uptick in zone contact percentage, which I always just think leads to more questions. Why, why is he getting hit more in the zone? Is it command? Is it the stuff isn't as crisp? Um, so do you see anything with Barrios that would give you some pause if you were considering him as someone to go trade for? You know, I, I you know, one of the things I do is go over to uh, Savant and look at the year-over-year changes uh, in their in their movement. And uh, his four seamer this year is getting more ride uh, than it did last year, or, or about the same. Um, you know, you can do. I, I go through vertical movement first, so uh, the curveball is uh, getting more drop and is about the same velo. Uh, it's getting more sweep too, so the curveball is not worse. Uh, the changeup is uh, getting more drop and um, and more sweep. So. He's generally getting more movement. Uh, the velo is the same or better. And uh, so there's nothing from the Savant page that says he's different fundamentally than he was last year. So at the very least, whatever you thought of him last year, uh, he should be have the same stuff as he had last year. Now, I guess last year, uh, you know, the 9.9% swing strike rate was a little bit underwhelming. It does cause some people in some corners of the internet to call him a Toby. Um, but, but, <laughs> some people in some corners. Well, Nick, Nick Pollock. Pollock has, no, Nick Pollock <laughs> has been very clear to say that he's not, Jose Barris is not a Toby to him. Uh, um, but I would say that, he, you know, if you look at the end of your stats for Jose Barrios in every year except for 2020, which did not allow him a full season, what you see is a mid three ZRA guy with a strikeout per inning and a decent whip and gives his chance to win games. I think he's going to be that again this year. And I know that he has he's a streaky guy. Uh, that is definitely something you can say about him. But if you give him, he's a bulk streaky guy, I say put him in your lineup, forget it. Just do it. I don't even think worry about matchups because sometimes he'll just he'll strike out every New York Yankee and then give up five against the Tigers. I don't know what it is. But it's not movement. It's not velo. The, the location numbers are good. Perhaps the command g- comes and goes. Perhaps people game plan against him well, and he's not. he doesn't adjust quick enough. I don't know what it is. He has bad games. He has bad streaks. But at the end of the season, every year save one, the short one, he's been good. So there's another sort of old school answer for you, although it is backed up by the fact that there's no change in his stuff and location numbers. Right, yeah, we see the left on base percentage also at a career worst right now, 84.3%. So not surprising. BABIP also up at 325. Uh, sometimes the, the old indicators are still pretty helpful if they point to bad luck. It's just to kind of affirms, well, if the stuff looks the same and you have these kind of bad luck metrics that are pointing to ratios that are bloated, most likely he comes back and looks like the guy we were accustomed to. Yeah, high three ZRA, 120s whip, similar ratios to Peralta, probably a lower strikeout rate, probably a slightly lower ceiling. Also, though, like I'm with you on leaving him in your lineup, even in 12-team leagues, just keep playing him. But I think there's a pretty big difference right now, matchup-wise, what he's going to see versus what Freddie Peralta sees catching so many teams in the NL Central. Also, like we are... Not very far into the season. And can I just do one thing? I know this is dumb. And you can cherry pick anybody. But can I just take his first game of the season out? Sure. Because let's just say short spring. He had he didn't even make it through a whole inning, right? If I take the first game of the season out, he's got a 266 ERA. 
and 20 strikeouts in 23 innings. Is there a problem here? It doesn't look like it if you do that. I know he had that game. <laughs> it's I'm yes. not saying it. I'm not saying we can erase it, but I have him in AL labor. I'm still in first, still in first, doing the still in first dance. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna do it. I don't care. I there's not there's no jinxes. Oh, you gotta play that audio when I lose. Yeah, uh, I gotta, I'm gotta make a note here. <laughs> May fifth, you know, victory dance. <laughs> yeah, talking mad shite about winning labor. <laughs> Oh okay. yeah, that was stupid. Anyway, uh, Barrios, I'm, I'm not worried about. <clears throat> Fair enough. We talked about Charlie Morton maybe a week or two ago, and at the time it was makes sense. It's by low, I think. In the time since then, he had a short start against the Cubs. Should have been a good get well opportunity for him. And then on Tuesday this week, he was on the road against the Mets. It was five runs, four earned, three Ks, and five and two thirds, three walks. The Mets are a good offense, like a top three off- offense in the league right now. So you're gonna have good pitchers not perform well against them, but uh, is it still a case where you're looking at Morton and, and trusting past Charlie Morton, most of past Charlie Morton to come back through the door? Are you starting to see some more warning signs that would make you more cautious about actually making a move to get him? You know, his bread and butter, the, the four seam and the curve look virtually the same. He's lost a little bit of sweep on the curve ball. Um, you can notice that he's starting to like, you know, a cutter and a, and the change up and the sinker, like he's starting to like go to those more often. And he used to be kind of almost a two or three pitch pitcher. So there is some old pitcher nervousness for me. I am slightly nervous about Morton. Um, you know, these, uh, the big deal I think is that, uh, the cliff, I haven't studied this in a while, but there used to be a cliff at 94 miles an hour where, um, if you were above or below that, like if, if you were a good pitcher that was 94 one or 94 five or something and had mo- most of your fastballs are over 94 and then you dropped into 93, uh, two as you as your average, that was worse than dropping from 95 to 94. Like there, that was, that's what the research suggested. There was a bit of a cliff at 94 where like between 90 and 94, it's a mitch mitch it's a it's a mish mish pitch podge like it's just maybe one it doesn't matter as much if you go up one or so but if you can get clear of 94 and you're averaging that more than 94 on all your fastballs then that's a, that's a clear jump and there, you saw a clear degradation and homers off of the fastball and you saw strikeouts go up i don't know where that shelf is but i think that shelf exists i would suggest that shelf is higher now right because that research was done when the average fastball was like 91 or 92. Now the average fastball this year is 94. <laughs> so yeah. if the shelf is 95 and Charlie Morton just went from 95.3 to 94.8, he could be on the wrong side of the shelf. That's something that should be picked up in Stuff Plus to some extent because we we – you know, fastball velocity is a relative metric. Uh, Charlie Morton still has a 106 number, but he had a 113 stuff plus coming into the season. He's actually one of the largest droppers in stuff plus. Now you add in that he went from above average locations to below average locations. And he dropped from 15 to 33 in my latest ranks. Uh, I don't know. Do I need to drop him more? I, I, I And I don't want to be wishy-washy. I'm worried about him, but the 106 stuff plus it's comparable to Freddie Peralta. And I said, I wasn't worried about Freddie Freddie Peralta. So it's still salvageable, but he's older coming off of injury. The fastball velo is down. I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about Charlie Morton than I am about Freddie Peralta. He's 38 years old. It's fair. Uh, I guess in terms of actionable stuff, if you have Morton on your roster, he's not a drop. I mean, even in, in shallow leagues, he's still projections. These are nice projections. It's like a Barrios projections. Three seven ERA, one two three WHIP, more than a strikeout per inning. But do you start to sit him in the toughest of the tough matchups based on what we've seen so far? The next time he catches the Mets, is he in your lineup in a shallow league or is he on the bench? But at the Mets, you would have pitched him because the, at the Mets, that it's a run suppressing environment. <sighs> well, look at that Dodgers game. 
you could have avoided uh, four runs in five innings by not pitching against the Dodgers. And yeah. what's his? Do you do you have a, a schedule schedule of fire in front of you for him? Mm, I can get one. What do you Magic. use for that? Roto-wire? I use the projected starters grid at RotoWire. And the next time we see Morton is home against the Brewers on Sunday, which is part of a two-start week. In a weekly league, you already committed to it. So in a league where you can decide home, I oh, think yeah. you got to use him for that spot. And the following week, he'd be yeah, home against the Padres. Decision? Home against the Padres. So the last in. time you saw the Padres, he gave up five runs and in five innings. He's in for me in that one. Yeah, he's still doing it because he's home? Yep. It's a tough home environment. But he's, his best game so far have been well, he's only had one good game. Whew. Frustrating player so far because I thought he was going to keep on doing something very close to what we saw from him a year ago. Wasn't worried about the injury that ended his season. You know, I, I thought he'd come back and just be himself. And so far, he just you know hasn't. What this, you know what this makes me think of? I mean, he's, he's lost some stuff, but he's lost more in location. And this makes me think of my pet theory that um, the reason why location isn't as sticky year to year is because little things that bother you, um, like if you have a big thing that's bothering you, then you're on the IL and you're not pitching. But if you have a little thing that's bothering you, like maybe it just doesn't feel that good on his landing leg. Could be. Was that is the it was it the landing leg that he got hit on? No, the is the drive leg. I think. I can't remember off he got the top hit on of my his head. right leg, and I think he's a right hander, so it's the drive leg. So maybe there's just some, maybe he's just not landing at the right time because he's not pushing off the same way. Maybe there's still some weakness in that leg. Uh, I mean, it's it, the fact that he threw 95 with it broken made me think, okay, he's going to be fine. <laughs> uh, but, you know, then he had to have a surgery and he had to have a rehab and maybe that, that put him behind plus the, the short spring. Plus he's rehabbing uh, during a lockout. So... I'm. I would. You know. I want to. I want to give people. So I don't want to say. Don't worry about any of these guys. So I would say with Morton, I'm. I'm slightly more worried about him. I like. You know. Home against the Padres. I really hope he. You know. He has that good game against the Brewers that you're already locked in for. And if he does, I think uh, home against the Padres is all right. All right. So probably a lower end SP two, possible SP three sort of expectation for Morton with a little yeah, red down had, there right now. I've had, yeah, I've had one start since I ranked him. And I had him right next to Peralta, 32, 33. Uh, with that start being another bad start, um, I could push him down uh, to, yeah, 30, 36, 37. Uh, like I had Tyler Megill uh, behind him, and I would have Tyler Megill ahead of him now. And Tyler Megill was 36. Here's one for you. What about Trevor Rogers? Trevor Rogers has had. I would say just two bad starts. One, re- one really bad start. One start against the Phillies. He went one and two thirds, gave up seven runs. All of them were earned. He walked four, only struck out three. It was one and two thirds. So, you know, whatever. K rate's been a little bit down, though, all season long. Had another bumpy outing last time out against Arizona. So the ratios don't look good. K's down, walks up. Stuff looks identical at a glance, at least, just in terms of the three pitch mix and the velocities. So, what do you make of Rodgers at this point? Well, one thing that's interesting is that his slider has the same amount of drop as it did last year, but now it's three, two miles an hour slower. And the 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 key with uh, sliders uh, is to have that movement profile and not lose the velo. So the velo still matters on sliders. And even though his overall velo looks like we all sort of gravitate towards towards fastball velo, mm-hmm. it is interesting that his slider velo is down. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a sloughing off uh, with his slider after the enforcement last year. Uh, he was, he is a changeup guy uh, coming up, um, and the slider was kind of a revelation. Um, so, you know, the fact that last year he had a 102 stuff plus, and so I didn't rank him that highly this year, and now, now he has 100 stuff plus is kind of related to the fact that his fastball doesn't have great ride and. It has uh, even less uh, ride than it did last year, and uh, his slider is not a good, not a great slider by Stuff Plus. So he's kind of, you know, one pitchy in a way. Uh, I pushed him to 19 in the preseason rankings because he has a really great home park. 
Uh, the changeup is still good. He had a 102 stuff, 102 location. He was projected uh, fairly well. Uh, I felt like I needed to put him there. His health outcome seemed okay. Uh, but he fell he fell pretty rapidly in my last uh, uh, update to 42nd. Um, I don't know. Do you have a sort of idea? Would you want me to play some Would You Rather with you? Hmm. My ranks? Yeah, throw a couple of Would You Rathers at me. All right, let me look around him. Uh, he's had... Uh, one start since my rankings and it was the bad one against Arizona. So he might even be a little bit lower. So I'll look lower than where I had him. Uh, Trevor Rogers or Alex Cobb. Uh, I'm going to go Rogers in this case. I know that the slider velo being down is a concern. I think the bigger issue with Rogers has been his fastballs getting hit. I think mm-hmm. his fastball location, his heat map looks kind of like it's catching too much of the plate right now. And, and it's not a very good pitch by Stuff Plus. Like, Yeah, it's just not a lot of room for error with that. Mm-hmm. So I think the fact that he gets whiffs with his other two pitches, and the fact that he throws three consistently, that gives me a little bit of, of optimism there. With Cobb, we've seen enough bad Alex Cobb where I still have that little bit of like steady fear when it comes to relying on him start over star, I still see mostly a home streamer, but a guy that at the Dodgers, a couple of his tougher matchups, I'm still going to pull out of that lineup every time. All right. Here's a uh, stuff plus comp that's around him um, uh, from Bervaldi's. It's not the same, but they're kind of one pitchy left-handers. Similar stuff plus. Probably going Fromber in this case. But not by a lot. Yeah, it's it's such an extreme ground ball profile. I, I know the the walks are kind of part scary. of part of what you get with Fromber are the walks. I think the K rate's probably not going to stay under twenty percent, even though I don't expect a ton from him. But he's he's different. He's just such a different sort of pitcher. So slight uh, edge to one who's ascendant, uh, but seems over his skis. Nestor Cortez or Trevor Rogers. Rogers. Nestor's a great story. I still worry about him having to deal with that division and that home park. All right. So I think Trevor Rogers uh, drops from 42 into the small fifties. Still very usable though. And then the other question would be the long-term if you're playing in a keeper or dynasty league and you have a chance to make a trade I'm for him. I'm not acquiring. I just, no? I, I trust my model too much. Also change up first guys are just not uh, what I want. Let's get to Tyler Malley, who, yes, he is the first starting pitcher on one of the teams I drafted. And yes, that team is actually the well. worst team. In the <laughs> worst <laughs> team I have <laughs> on NFBC. I have one, two, three, four. I'm counting teams I co-manage. I've got eight teams. It is easily the worst of the eight teams I have uh, over there. And there's a few other names on here. That you knew it when it was happening. Down. You were like, uh-oh, I, I think I pushed this. Don't have to start pitching thing too far. Yeah, the funny thing is, I'm going to look at the standings for that league. Is it actually a full-on pitching problem, or is there something else going on with that team? Survey says, yep, 18.5 pitching points. In a Whoa, that's league. pretty low. <laughs> There's one team in the league with uh, less on the pitching front than me there. <laughs> my hitting's great. My hitting is third best in the league. That's That's been the calling card in many of my teams this year. This, this, this hitting's amazing. Well, yeah, your hitting's amazing because you overspent on hitting and didn't spend enough on pitching, doofus. <laughs> you're gonna cheap out on pitching you got to get the right ones yeah uh the thing that's uh that's interesting about him is that he never really had great uh in the model he never really had great stuff plus uh, to begin the season was 101 but good command uh 104 right now my latest uh update uh He's, I think, in the same place. I think uh, 100, no, 99 stuff plus, so a little bit down, 104 location plus. I think what I failed uh, to account for, although uh, I still actually did not change him very much from preseason ranks. I had 53 in the preseason ranks, 54. I think maybe he deserves to go a little bit down. I think maybe 60 is where I start to consider guys streamers. But I think actually, and you know, I think that number kind of gets smaller every year. There are definitely pitchers like Trevor Rogers. Do you try them every every time? Do you start? You don't start Nestor Cortez every time. Do you start Framber Valdez every time? Framber, I think, is closer to an every start guy because of 
park and because of his approach his approach just seems like it, it can but if work fromber was a red right yeah you you don't have so. the home park buffer of use all the time you have you do have that with alex cobb but i think rogers yeah. is a lot like cobb in terms of the the matchups i would sit him for difficult road matchups trevor rogers against the mets right now you want to throw him out there I'd be looking carefully at the alternatives in a case like that. Mally, I mean, the Reds are so amazingly bad, and they've had some bad luck too. But they're a bad team that will probably keep paring down as the season long, goes along. I won't give him wins. Like, you know, some of these, he got a loss against the Padres at home where he went five and a third, gave up three, had five strikeouts and two walks. That's an acceptable game that, other pitchers win that he probably had no chance of ever winning. Yeah, I wonder wonder what the breakdown is on that. Five and change with three earned and a K per inning. How often do you actually get a win from those pitchers? I mean, he, that's like 100% loss for him. So he's not going to give you much in wins. You kind of don't want to pitch him uh, at home as much, but you know his worst start of the year came in Dodger Stadium. So if you don't want to pitch him, you only want to pitch him at home against the worst offense. Uh, you would maybe have pitched him at home against St. Louis and Cleveland. Um, is that fair? That would have given you eight innings and six runs. Um, and then you would pitch him. We want to pitch him away, um, but maybe not in Milwaukee. I, you could almost you, and not against the Dodgers. So if you took, if you had been like very cautious with Tyler Molly from the beginning, you would have right now. The St. Louis game at home, the Cleveland game at home, and the Atlanta game on the road, I think. And uh, in between all those, you would have 14 innings with seven runs. Nope, not all those are earned. Six earned runs. You could do worse. Mm. I mean, I don't I don't think it's droppable. I think he's still a decent pitcher. Uh you know, the location is, I think that the he's nibbling. You know, he's had these high walk rates, but good location numbers. And I just feel like either he's nibbling or the high fastball is showing up as good locations, but it's not in the zone good locations. Like, he's just not keeping it in the zone. Well, he hasn't given up a home run until his sixth start, which is pretty surprising given the difficulty of the matchups on the road and that he had three starts at home before finally giving up that homer. Yeah, but and then a f- near 400 Babbitt, there's definitely some luck in there. It, his projections ran from a 4.11 ERA to a 4.4 ERA. I feel like if you t- even if you took that worse uh, or a 4.5 ERA from Steamer, I feel like even if you took that Steamer 4.5 ERA and you just didn't start him in those bad starts, I think he's what uh, Paul Sporer calls a team streamer, which is a guy I want. I would still want on my team, and I would be just be shuttling him from the bench to the rotation. I bet he'll pop up on wires that probably already has in tens and probably some twelves with the ERA sitting just north of seven and the whip at one seventy one for Tyler Malley at this. I've point. got him in a twelve team dynasty. I'm holding it's dynasty. Like I'd rather he get traded to a, a nicer park. I like you know the the package is still okay. Uh, it, he has a good cutter, um, but I'm not starting him every time. A couple more. We'll do rapid fire on these. Jose Urquidy. You cannot do rapid fire on Jose Urquidy. I'm sorry. This is this is this is really really important because there is nothing on Jose Urquidy's line that really <laughs> says that you need to go get him. Like, I mean, yes, the walk rate is tiny. He has really good command. He's shown that from the beginning, but he's giving up a ton of homers. So maybe he's living in the zone too much. His strikeout minus walk rate is not good. It's around average, and his strikeout rate is so low. And he's a changeup first guy, so you could say maybe he's never going to have a good, str- never going to have a changeup. He's giving up fifty percent fly balls right now. I mean, uh, the projections are run from a four two to a four five, uh, but not with the same strikeout rate as Molly or Mally. So it's kind of hard to like look at at traditional numbers and say he's worth it. The model still likes him as much as ever, and in fact, he's like improved some of his pitches. Uh, you know, in terms of his ride, he's got more ride now on his four seamer. His changeup has more sweet and then more sweep than it did last year. His slider has three inches more sleep sweet than it did last year. Like what? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills when I look at, at him. I have no idea what to do. I have no idea what to do with him. I'm I'm holding just because my model tells tells me to. 
but Dino has gone full Mugatu in this last you, two minutes. You do not have to be me. So you can look at all these other things and be like, listen, the model doesn't always hit, Eno. I'm sorry. I'm dropping Jose Arquiti. And that's fine. Don't judge me, though, for holding on a little bit longer because the model has always liked him. And he has been good. It's not like he... Not like he's never been good. He has like a three seven nine ERA for his for his career, one oh six whip. Like he just never has struck out a lot of people, and right now it looks pretty bad. I am fairly certain he has matched up with do? the Jays twice. Oh. He's his schedule so far, he's made four starts entering Thursday. At the Angels, it's an improved team, it's not striking out a lot. Did well. At Seattle, got rocked in a spot where he should have pitched well. Home against the Jays, actually pitched well. And then rode against the Jays for his very next start. Had six Ks in five innings, but did give up four runs on I seven hits. I think it's a hold. It's Toronto. Like what do you look at? Do you and also just from- look at uh, take Seattle out and leave Toronto in, and he's got sixteen innings uh, with uh, uh, with uh, seven earned runs, eleven Ks, two walks. If you do that, it's yeah. not terrible. That's a four ERA. The Jays are a filthy offense to have to deal with. So if you've only made four starts and two of them were against Toronto, you know, that's not you exactly even what you're looking terrible for. in those two. I don't know. I don't know. What would I, I do? Know. I'm I still if I'm not playing against you, I already have them. So I'm, <laughs> I'm riding it out and I'm still starting him. I think if I were looking at Urquidy versus Mali as possible by lows, I actually like Urquidy more because I think the team context is bad enough oh, for yeah. Mali where I'd but rather better than the guy on the good team in this case. And, and, and another thing that's so t- tough about Mali is like, you know, when you're streaming guys, I think you want to start them at home. You were talking about that with Charlie Morton. Like the pitchers do perform better at home. I think there's some comfort. There's some that. If you have a guy that you'd want to start at home, but his home is Cincinnati or like Colorado or something, then you're always starting him on the road. And like they're at a disadvantage on the road. So that sucks. With Orkiti, mm-hmm. if you were like, okay, I'm going to start him at home against most offenses and on the road in in good in good parks against not so tough offenses, you would be starting him a lot more games than than Molly, right? Than Ma- Mally. 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 Um, Although you know, Mal bad, um, but so Mally. I have I have Orkiti four ahead of of Mally. Uh, I think I and it, a 105 stuff plus 106 location plus like. That was enough for me to put him ha- higher. I don't think I'm dropping him much because of that last start against Toronto. I think, yeah, I think he's a better buy low than Tyler Malley. I think Tyler Malley is a, is a drop in 10-teamers. And if you're a, a streamer type in 12-teamers, I think he can be a drop. I'm keeping him in 12-team dynasties and 15-team uh, plus. But with Orkidi, I think you could almost see him as an acquisition target. How about Kyle Hendricks? No, I'm... The model doesn't like him. The numbers don't like him. Nothing likes him. Uh, and I think he's just a, a reminder uh, to not really. Taking the L. Yeah. I mean, there are pitchers who have great command and succeed through great command. Uh, they're just rarer. I, I, and I, and they're, they're harder to bet on. And I think he's a, an example of that. Deep, deep league streamer. Maybe one more guy we're going to get to in just a minute who kind of fits into a similar profile. Wait, they just, run has hot. he had one good start? Hendricks, yeah, seven scoreless against the Pirates when the Cubs. And that would have been a, that would have been one you. That's when you pick him up. And if that was like one week where he had Pittsburgh and the Rays uh, at home, I don't know. I can't. I'm not looking at a calendar. If that was like a one week two start, like then you then you made out like a bandit. I think in a lot of mixed leagues, Kyle Hendricks has gone from the guy that you hold in starts you don't like and then play when you like him to the guy that you add for a drop. start you like and then drop until the next yeah, opportunity and, from, and someone else might get him. And then it's a little bit of a... Gone from team streamer to actual streamer. Yeah, it's just a little bit of a, hey, you know, if I if I don't get him back, well, the, the bad outing against a good matchup might actually happen to someone else and you're just not going to sweat it too much. You'll try to take advantage of it when you can, but it's not always going to be there. I mean, can okay. I can I do a quick uh, profile com- uh, like a profile comp for Hendricks? Sure. Uh, going into the season, he had a 94 stuff plus 107 location plus. He was like Miles Michaelis, worked out for Miles Michaelis, but stuff's a little bit better. He was like Zach Greinke, uh, has worked out for Greinke. So you don't want to like piece out on the type completely, uh, but uh, he was also like Luke Weaver, uh, Zach Thompson a little bit. 
JT Brewbreaker. Yeah, see, uh, previously Hendricks was above these guys in terms of, of trust level, and now I think he's appropriately for me in my head. Cole Irvin, it worked you know, out. Well, he's pitching in a damp basement with a yeah. soggy ball. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Alec Mills, he was like Alec Mills in the model, did not work out. I mean, I just think that the 50 50, it doesn't work out that way if you look at high, pl- high stuff guys, you know what I mean? Mm hmm. Like you're do better than 50 50 if you, if you, if I, do you want me to list out the high stuff guys? Or although I guess to be fair, high stuff, low command. Let me do some of those. Freddie Peralta, Shohei Otani, Dylan Cease, Logan Gilbert, Blake Snell. We're doing better than 50 50. Pretty much like all those guys. Who else? Who else has high? Tanner Houck. If you want to call him a loss, we're still doing better than 50 <clears> 50. <throat> I think you're five out of six. Yeah, um, I'm 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 losing the uh, high command guys because I'm at the bottom of the ranks. Uh, um, uh, who is there? Anybody down here? Hey, you, Edward Cabrera, Ronzi Contreras. You, I mean, you made this incompletes. Though. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. Nate Pearson, I guess, if you want to add a loss, but I mean the season's not over. Yep. One more pitcher I want to throw at you is Herman Marquez. I only have him in NL labor where he stays in all the time because I feel like that's the only league in which I could ever trust myself to use him correctly because I don't have a choice. The only choice I do have is to release him if I'm unhappy with what I see. That's a 12 team NL only league. So anyone getting bulk <laughs> oh should God. be rostered. But he and might still be a minus for you. <laughs> he, he's definitely hurt me so far. And <laughs> I mean... I don't think I can't remember the last time I cut a clear starter. What I think is a good pitcher who starts, even though it's been a disaster. K rate down at 15%, zone contact percentage 93.4%. I was looking at that as a, a rolling average. And as that number has gone up for him in the past, things have completely unraveled. Home runs per nine up above two right now. And yeah, the left on base percentage 60.1%. That's the worst of his career. Babbitt at 360. Of course, there's the the bad luck indicators also working against them, but there's more than bad luck right now causing Marquez to get hit like this. Yeah, and I mean, if I saw somebody with this profile that pitched anywhere else, I don't know. Maybe I could convince myself the ground ball rate is good, the walk rate is low, you know. But the the margin for error in Colorado is just such that I'm not, I, I can't, I'm not interested. It's so stupid. He's, he's so much, the, the bat has him at 492 mm-hmm. for the ERA and a 145 whip for the rest of the year. That, that tells me he should actually be a cut. If I'm following that, he's probably a drop in this format. If I can find anyone else that actually gives me innings. Yeah. I, I'm digging out of a ratios hole because of him. <laughs> so he seems like one of the best ways out, except the fact that you can just keep digging the hole deeper. I'm terrified of Colorado. I had him ranked 152nd coming into the season and unranked in my last update. Well, you called it. I mean, like you, you did the right thing because well, I tried to play the. What about Cool high... and Gomber and those guys? Or you know, maybe that maybe just give them time. <laughs> they'll they'll do the Freaky Friday thing. They'll switch. I wouldn't bet on Cool and Gomber again next year. I you, you bet another this month. Years. Yeah, right. Exactly. Colorado, man. I am so sorry. Yeah, just not a fun place to have to try and figure it out. For now, he's a NL only league hold for me. Uh, if I could reserve him, I probably would, but I can't. So I will see this movie <laughs> to its completion. <laughs> it's like the is uh, this part. I don't even. Yeah. I don't even try you to know watch this it, movie. Bitch. This is from. Wait, which movie is that from? Clockwork Orange. Oh no! Nah, yeah. Is it Clockwork Orange or is it uh, nineteen uh, the Brazil? The I don't know. 1984 one where they, they forced the guy's eyes open to watch. <laughs> don't know, but I, I, I understand. Uh, I think it's Brazil, yeah. Well, okay. We went through a ton of pitchers. There is uh, one more question here that I wanted to get to on this episode. It's kind of a scouting versus projections question. It was sent to us by uh, Andy from Milwaukee. Uh, Andy writes, I'm new to projections and learning what current advanced statistics are. When current advanced statistics become stickier to a current season, the question popped into my head during the Taylor Ward versus Brian Reynolds discussion. Eno indicated that up to a certain marker or milestone, such as at bats, balls in play, or pitches, previous performance in league averages outweigh current performance in the projection. My question is on the previous performance part. 
Do any projection models take into consideration the difference in scouting and planning that pitchers may have on hitters in the minors versus the majors? I'm thinking of a hitter who is productive in the minors, gets called up partway through the major league season, and performs well. He then makes the big league team out of spring training the following year, but starts slow and seems to have underlying indicators of poor future outcomes, such as a high O-swing percentage. Could this be due to increased data available to the club at the MLB level, and is there a way to predict the influence of this? Go Brewers. Thanks again. Mm. There, in terms of like advanced data, the difference between the minors and the majors is shrinking because most teams now have like not only track man in the minor leagues, but something called like Kinetrax, which uh, tracks limbs and so the scouting in the minor leagues has taken a big step forward in terms of what they can know about you. But I also heard in that, if, am I wrong, that a little bit of like a what happens to a player as other teams garner a scouting report on them and like pay more attention to them because you don't game plan for everybody else in, an, in another team's minor league system the same right. way as you do for the team you're going to play tonight in the major leagues. Right. There's a lot more effort going into solving the, how do we get the big league hitters out? Yeah. So, and then I do think that there, there is something to like Randy Rosarena. There's something there, right? you got a guy who comes up. They don't really necessarily, everybody has like a, a ready-made scouting report and he just blows through the playoffs. And, you know, then people kind of spend some time and identify some weaknesses and start picking at that weakness and, now it's on him to to readjust. I think the best players adjust quickly. I mean, that's obvious, but there's something there to be to bet on, which is someone who does, you know, maybe he does well or does poorly. Maybe he does poorly at first, but then he he writes it quickly because there is definitely a pendulum as people adjust to you and you adjust back. There is definitely a cat and mouse game. And there is something to this idea that like someone can come up and be good. Like Dylan Carlson is probably struggling with that right now. Yeah. You know? Big example. Vlad Guerrero like was, was like raw good and then figure something out and was like amazing. Good. Yeah. And I was trying to pin this down because I remember when, when Vlad jr. Came up, there was this, uh, this idea that teams were, already pitching him like a middle of the order big league hitter yes that's true the, the distance from the heart of the zone thing. Yeah. yeah but it's like why would they only apply that to him it, it just seems kind of strange to me like that they would wouldn't you have the same process just across the board for new players or was it just that they'd seen so many people had eyes on him that they tried to come up with a, a plan that would actually work against him because they they saw enough where they had to start that game planning early. Like, I, I just think that's kind of a strange quirk. I mean, maybe there's other players that have experienced something similar that we were paying less attention to by comparison. And it's just kind of slipped by us. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, like Jeremy Pena is interesting because he's not, he, he's like, a, he's a bloodlines guy too, but um, he's not necessarily like a consensus top five pick where everybody's like, Oh, I've got my Jeremy Pena plan in place. Right. Right. And he comes up and he's, I don't know, has he been streaky? He's been a little up and down, uh, but he's been like pretty good across the board, uh, making good contact, has been barreling the ball, good raw power. Uh, I don't know. There's something about this that makes me think like, I, I wonder what the, what the adjustment process is going to be like for him. I am uh, I'm a liar. That's why, that's why we like chase rate, though. It, it's mm -hmm. another reason why you like chase rate, right? Because they're just not going to chase, like, as the scouting report gets better or worse or anything around them, if they're good at chase rate, then they're not, then they're not going to, like, chase the pitcher's pitch. It's going to make it harder, no matter what your game plan is, if you're facing someone that doesn't have a high chase rate. It just still blows my mind that a 229, 301, 470 line is... 30% better than league average right now because that's what Jeremy Pena has done so far. Five homers, you know. I did not nice expect that WRC stat. plus when I scanned across, but that is the current offensive environment for sure. I thought like 105 because of the power. Yeah. yeah. 130. Whoa. That is 
it's happened almost every time I've looked at a line and then looked over at the WRC plus it's been a number that I didn't expect usually to the high side. That's typically the way that that has played out uh, so far. Uh, I'm a big liar. I got one more question I want to squeeze in because uh, I think it's kind of similar in nature. This one came in from Clinton and he was previously looking at Willie Calhoun before Calhoun got sent down uh, because there was uh, some encouraging signs. There were encouraging signs in the X stats for Willie Calhoun. So Clinton's question was, when would you start trusting X stats over projections? If ever did the descriptive nature of these X stats show some meaningful change, maybe occurring or is the sample just too small to trust any of this? Well, the difficulty right now uh, is particular because the run environment has changed so drastically that it's really exacerbating a problem with the X stats, which is that X stats are recalibrated usually around the all-star break for the current run environment. So if you're in a season which is looks a lot like the season before, we had seasons like sort of 2016, 2017, 2018 that were fairly similar to each other where you'd say, okay, you know, this run environment is the same as last year. I can maybe trust this, uh, this ex Woba, but like you just pointed out with Jeremy Pena, a line that we would have thought was slightly better than league average is like bongo, like 30, 30% better than league average. Like, you know, that, that has something to do with why Willie Calhoun has a, you know, 247 expected batting average on a 136 average. I would not trust that expected batting average. Um, and in any case, the 247 expected batting average, 391 expected slugging is not very exciting anyway. And especially for a player who doesn't have defensive value or, uh, or, uh, uh, or run. Uh, someone did send me a quote that was pretty interesting from Willie Calhoun saying that, um, you know, he didn't think uh, he was going to hit the type of homers that the new coaching staff was expecting out of him um, and that their approach didn't work for everybody. And that's sort of what I was trying to get at. I, it doesn't mean that he's not coachable. Sometimes uh, a certain type of coaching strategy doesn't work with a certain type of hitter. And that's why I mentioned over at um, – uh, I have a tweet about this with Evan Longoria that he said it's great when we have three or four hitting coaches because, you know, one of them speaks your language. One of them can connect with you. And even if there's a good overarching plan for the hitters, you know, you can you can find someone that you that connects with you and talks to you the same way the way that you like to talk about hitting. And so maybe Willie Calhoun didn't find that. Maybe he didn't find, uh, you know, a hitting hitting coach brethren that 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 sort of meshed with the way that he thought about hitting. Um, when I see him in terms of, you know, hitting the ball hard, um, and, uh, in decent angles, uh, with a really good bat to ball, like that's somebody that I would love to work with. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, statistically, uh, Donnie Ecker probably had that circle as someone he could help. But, uh, if he doesn't think he can hit homers like these other people, I would say, why not? You have 110, 111 max exit velo. Why can't we tap into that, that raw power? Uh, but if he thinks he needs to be more of a 20 homer hitting, uh, you know, line drive guy, which might be good for the ne- the new run environment, might be the right way to go, then maybe he just needs to find a new hitting coach, a new organization that's going to, you know, talk to him the way that he that that he understands baseball. So uh, I still think there's some upside, but without the defensive value um, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't be using uh, XBA and X slugging uh, for uh, – or ex Woba right now for my fantasy purposes. Yeah, those X stats. I think for the reason you mentioned, not being recalibrated with this run environment. Everyone looks amazing. Well, maybe yeah. the run environment's lower. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Thanks for sending us that question, Clinton. If you got a question for a future episode, feel free to send that our way. Rates and barrels at theathletic.com is the email address. You can drop a question under this video on YouTube if you're watching us there as well. We'd greatly appreciate it if you took the time to leave us a rating and review as well. So if you don't already have a subscription to the athletic you can get that at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels read the swinging is bad piece that you know had go up on thursday among other things on the site i thought yeah ken's piece about wander and, and the the action players was kind of just an interesting food for thought as well so be sure to uh, check that out uh, and before we go the day is finally here the 2022 top series one baseball nft collection drops today it's available exclusively now at topsnfts.com. Head to the site to get your packs now. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening.